Well, let me tell you a nice story before we get started. This very, very wealthy man is going to get married the next day. And he's sitting in front of his fireplace in his tuxedo. And his girlfriend, he's to marry the next day, is sitting there in a long, flowing, white, formal. And they're sipping out of a tall, expensive bottle of champagne. He said, dear, I know we're getting married tomorrow. Can I ask you one last question before we get married? She thought about it and said, yes. What is it? He said, now forbid that this should ever happen. But in five or six years after we're married, if I would lose all of my money, would you still love me? She thought for a long time and she said, yes, but I would miss you. <laughs> <laughs> You know what makes that so funny, don't you? <laughs> it's so close to the truth. <laughs> now, I will have a very few of my slides on moral government of God in here. Perhaps one of the first ones that we will start with. It's not going to be a lesson on moral government. Some of you have heard me lecture many times on the moral government of God. By the way, I'm the first teacher YWAM ever had, dead or alive. <laughs> first one they ever, ever, ever had. And I would teach them when we'd have an outreach. I'd teach them in the morning, teach them at night. And they'd go out. They'd go out in the afternoon and try to punch on doorbells and witness to people. And uh, many of them found out they didn't have much to witness about. To witness about nor did they know how to do it. So that's why we started the first SOEs. I, I was the first teacher in Switzerland, the one over there. I take it back. Francis Schaefer, he took them the first two weeks. I took them the second two weeks. So we see, we made them think. You know, thinking's hard work. But Charles Grandison Finney said, true religion requires thinking, intense thinking. Did you get that? Intense thinking. We usually say that 5% of the people think, 5% of the people think they think, and 90% of the world would rather die than think. <laughs> now, you ought to write this one down. I don't even remember who I copied this from anymore. It was some great philosopher. He said, if you get people to think they think, they'll love you. If you can get people to think they think, they'll love you. But if you really get them to think, they'll hate you. You're going to see a little bit of this today, a little bit of this. I've gotten people so mad when I've lectured, sometimes they've waited outside to beat me up. I don't mean here. I don't mean here, but many places around, around the world where I've lectured. I even had a fellow wait for me one time outside a Baptist church to beat me up. I said, go ahead. I'm a, from a family of 11 kids. I never had a beating. <laughs> In fact, a fellow said to me here a year or so ago, he said, Brother Harry, I love you like a brother. I said, don't give me that kind of love. My brother used to beat the daylights out of me. <laughs> I don't need any of that kind of love. <laughs> All right, so if somebody now will wake up the whoever's running the slide to Oh, talk about a snake. It'd bite me, wouldn't it? Now, I don't know how to run this flying machine here. I, I, I understand this part of it. There you go. I think we ought to, that's right. And uh, maybe we ought to close these shades or something. Now, my friends, you're going to find that, are those really in there in the rotation, the numbers that were on them? Yeah. You're going to find that the word moral in our day, in the universities and colleges, now even in high schools, the word moral is a dirty word. Because, as you well know, they've been teaching kids now for a long time. And nothing is absolutely right, nothing's absolutely wrong, and they're absolutely sure. The <laughs> fact is, I had a friend who was... Uh, graduating from uh, Brooklyn College. He graduated number two in a class of 750. 
had this Jewish professor teach them this particular day that nothing in the realm of morals is absolutely right, nothing's absolutely wrong, and if it felt good, go ahead and do it. So this Puerto Rican lad, very brilliant lad, he raised his hand and was recognized. He said to the professor, how about what Hitler did to the Jews? Wasn't that absolutely wrong? And the professor hardly missed a beat. He said, not if it felt good to Hitler. Now, let me tell you something, friends. When you read my book, that is, you that can read. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. In California now, it's against the law to give a man a high school diploma if he can't read. And now in our colleges, we got, we got remedial reading, remedial writing, and remedial arithmetic. Because our school system is so shot today. Don't anybody here try to impress me that you're, you're the smartest generation ever came down the line. I've been around too long for that. <laughs> I've been around too many schools. But if you had gone up to this man, and if you had kicked him right in the shins, he'd hop around a little, wouldn't he? You keep on doing that. You know what he said? Don't do that. It's wrong. You know why? It's happening to him now. You see, when it happens to us, we can get something out of the abstract down into the concrete real quick, can't we? Out of the abstract, down into the concrete very, very quickly. So, I mentioned in my book, it seems nowadays we are educating people away from their common sense. See, the purpose of education is not to separate you from your common sense. It is to refine and sharpen and develop your common sense. That's the purpose of education. Ah, but nowadays, the universities, if you talk to the presidents, they'd say, well, uh, our purpose has, has changed in the last 50 years. It's no longer to take these young people and teach them and train their minds so they can lead useful and fulfilled lives and work with the problems in the world. They say, now the purpose of a university is so the professors can seek truth in an unrestricted way, and the, the tuition of the students is only to pay the freight. Isn't that terrible? Just a necessary evil, just to pay the freight so these professors. But by the way, they don't believe there's any such thing as truth. So our universities and colleges, they now exist so the professors can seek something that doesn't exist. Isn't that ridiculous? But by the way, how would you define truth? If there is no such thing as truth, I've often said to people, tell me what is truth. I put this on the blackboard here last night for some people that were willing to think. I think I'll just give you a, let me give you a definition of truth, will you? I think you ought to write it down. Truth is the reality of a given situation circumstance or subject. Truth is the reality. But by the way, if you don't know what reality is, then you don't know what truth is, because that's in your definition of truth. Now, write this down. Reality is the situation of the subject, circumstance, or facts as they really are. Not as they appear, but as they really are. Very few things in this world are as they appear. Now I'm getting off into metaphysics, but let me give you a nickel's worth of metaphysics. I can't give you much more nickel's worth. I only got 15 cents worth. <coughs> metaphysics is a study of reality. Metaphysics is a study of reality. That means it's a study of things as they really are. But you've got to do a little extra thinking to see a situation as it really is, not as it appears. Now, how many of you have ever said, and used this kind of language? I know, I have thousands of times. I used to call my wife up when I was courting her. I said, I'll see you, honey, when the sun goes down. 
And I've said to fellows in the f about fishing, I'll see you in the morning when the sun comes up. Have you ever used that kind of language? Of course you have. That's pre-Copernicus language. Has the sun ever gone down? Has the sun ever come up? No. The fact is, I was on Pat Robertson 700 Club one time, and the man on before me, it was the most horrendous thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> and I'm sitting in there all prayed up, and I come out behind that curtain, and he introduces me. Brother Cod, wasn't that great what we just heard? I thought it was a pile of baloney. <laughs> And it was unadulterated, pile of baloney. I, you know what I said? How can a guy that's all prayed up lie, right? Start out with the lie, say, oh yeah, that's wonderful. No, no, not this guy. I call a spade a spade, I don't call it a horticulture instrument. <laughs> Let me tell you what I said. I said, Pat, I wish you wouldn't ask me to comment on that. That's all I said. He looked like I took a bottle of, or a bucket of ice water and poured it right down. I, well, he said, Brother Khan, don't you think the don't you think the Bible's a great book of science? I said, No, I don't even believe it's a book of science. It has some science in it, but it's also got a lot of pre-Copernicus language in it. He said, What do you mean by that? Well, up to the time of Copernicus, they used to think that the sun ran around the world, didn't they? That's Ptolemaic type of astronomy. I said, Pat, any kid with eighth grade astronomy, they'll shoot you out of the saddle. The Bible has a lot of pre-Copernicus language. It isn't that God didn't know, but that's the way people talk. And by the way, that's the way we communicate yet with pre-Copernicus language. So when he says, I'll watch over you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun, he's trying to get across a principle, not trying to be scientifically correct. You see that? That's a problem in communication. So you communicate with people in the kind of language they understand. Oh, he said, oh, oh, I never thought of that. Well, I said, in my background, I can't come out and make statements like this, you know, in front of all these people in the United States. Eighth grade science will shoot you out of the saddle. So, look at this definition of moral. It means having to do with right and wrong. Now then, we're studying ethics. I want you to look at this very closely. The foundation or ground of morality does not come from the Ten Commandments, but from the very nature of things or beings. This is a thing, but it's not a being, is it? You're a being. A being can think, can choose, it can feel, can reason. This can't do any of that. So the foundation, by what I mean by foundation, means reason, means reason. So the foundation or ground of morality does not come from the Ten Commandments, but from the nature of things or being, as they were created by our great God. And the, get this now, in the original creation. Now think about that one a little while. I ask you this question. See, I want to get you people to start thinking, you know. I had a girl one time, why wan come out to me out in California. I'd been there for a week or two. She said, Mr. Khan, you fried my brain this week. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I didn't. I just got out of neutral. <laughs> <coughs> you fried my brain. No, 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 no. I don't know anybody running around with fried brains. I know a, guy, a lot of them could sell theirs and get uh, a lot of money for it because they've never been used. <laughs> not even second hand, not even been used, see? Is God holy because he's holy or is God holy because he chooses to use all of his great endowments of personality and character in a right way? Is God holy because he's holy? You know, I was taught in the early days that something up here behind God's will that made him holy. We don't know what that is, whether it's an electric motor or a stick of dynamite, but <laughs> that's what Methodism used to teach. Old John Wesley believed that. I'm not making fun of Wesley. Is God holy because he's holy? Or is he holy because he chooses to use all these great endowments, personality and character, and a right in a loving way. Yeah, that's, that's what makes him holy. And by the way, that's what will make you holy. 
If you don't, you won't be holy. Don't kid yourself about it. God doesn't have a hunk of holiness he gives to people. <laughs> slice you off a little slice of it, you know. No. And by the way, same thing is true of the eternal life. So, when you begin to look at it in such a way as that, then you have to ask yourself some questions. By the way, I hope you got lots of questions. If you don't have questions, you're dead. <laughs> Did you know that? And God never minds you asking him an honest question. I'm here to tell you he has honest, satisfying answers for every question you got. But you're not going to get the answers like this. Mental. Uh, no, no, no. That's superstition. He'll make you sweat a little. He'll make you read. He'll make you study. And if you got any sense, you down you pray a lot, won't you? Then you'll remember the answer to that. If you could get the answers to all your questions just this easy, two weeks from now, two days, you wouldn't even remember what the question was, let alone the answer, would you? He tells you in Proverbs 2 how you'll get understanding. You'll search for her as you search for hid treasures and as you seek for silver. How do you think I get money? You think I got a tree that grows it? <laughs> I work for it. That's the way you're going to get understanding. Now, my friends, in the United States, I believe we got more Bible knowledge than any country in the world, but perhaps the least amount of understanding. Now, Bible knowledge doesn't really mean much if you don't have understanding to go with it. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. May I borrow your Bible here, young lady? I'm going to show you now the difference between knowledge and understanding. In Proverbs 2, the first 11 verses, five times, God says in a little different way each time, I would that you would get knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding. They are not synonymous. They are not synonyms. But get this, dear Christian friend, neither are they antonyms. The Christian church today acts like they're antonyms. As if God puts a wonderful premium on ignorance. Oh, no. What does the Bible say? Come now, let us feel together. <laughs> Come, let us feel together. Is that what it says? Well, what does it say? Reason. Oh, reason. Oh, you got to use this thing up here for something other than to keep your spinal cord from unraveling, don't you? Real Christianity starts with thinking. With thinking. And the person who will not do some serious thinking about the moral problems of this life and his own life, he's just not going to make it. He won't get converted in the first place. Now, what have I got in my hands, dear friends? Bible. Yeah, a book, right? Now, how do you know that? Tell me. You, you, you could, you got the right answer. How do you know it? You could see it. That's right. And some of you can even hear it, right? And I can feel it. So through three of the senses, I know it, don't I? Now, I'm going to release my grasp of this. What's going to happen? Like that. It's going to fall. Why? Gravity. Why gravity? Law. Why law of gravity? God made it. <laughs> explain to me. Why? Explain to me why, why it falls. I know a lot of people spinning, but they don't have it. <laughs> now, see, you're just like the typical audience in the United States, and I've asked this in a lot of places and colleges. And you see, you had knowledge of this, what it was and what was going to happen, but you had almost no understanding. The understanding is the why. And understanding is the comprehension of, of the action. Understanding is a correct interpretation of the facts. Do you get that? So what good is it to have a lot of Bible knowledge, Ed, with almost no understanding? 
And that's one of the things I want to do here today is work on your understanding. Otherwise, to get you to understand what you already know. Because it won't do you any good until you have understanding of it. Now, when it says, thou shalt not steal, is it wrong not to steal because it's in the Bible, or is it in the Bible because it's wrong? The Bible That's right. That's right. It's in the Bible because it is wrong. It, just putting it in the Bible doesn't make it wrong, does it? So in, in days to come when you begin to teach ethics to some people, and I hope that many of you will, and you'll get some good books on this, you find real good ones, let me know, I'll buy them too. <laughs> I have a tremendous library on ethics. And by the way, the good ones in there, I'm ashamed to say this, are not written by Protestants. I'm ashamed to say it. And the Catholics don't know about the others. They're, they're, they've had some great men of God that have written them, but uh, people don't read tough subjects like ethics. Did you know only 6% of the Americans read a book a year? You know what they read? My Life with Bogey. <laughs> My goodness, they got minds like sewers. You read that trash? My Life with Humphrey Boogeyman, you know. <laughs> Boy, they'll read that trash. They'll read that junk. But good books don't sell. Even in the religious bookstores, they don't sell. You don't go in and buy books that's going to make you think. You go in and read about men's experiences. They don't do you any good. The good books, we say, we fellows who write, say it's a bubblegum religion books that sell. And by the way, if you want to know how much money I ever made out of writing, I think maybe I might have made 40 cents an hour. Even in the technical realm, I've had about 200 things published. Isn't that a shame that the good stuff doesn't sell? My book, Four Trojan Horses, won't even sell in Texas because there's no pictures in it. <laughs> and the state of Washington. <laughs> you got to put pictures in them if you want the people in Washington and Texas to read them. Now, I hope to get in today to what makes right, right, and what makes wrong, wrong. Just don't quote a man a verse of scripture. That's not sufficient for anyone that's going to think. And by the way, if they won't think, you're not going to get them converted anyway. So I want to look in today. What makes right, right, and what makes wrong, wrong? It isn't wrong because it is printed in the Bible. It says, thou shalt not steal, and that makes it wrong. No, no. It's in the Bible because it is wrong by the very nature of the act. Now, that word nature, most of us, we've kicked that around most of our life without having the slightest idea what nature means. You're going to see that when I tell you that a baby's not born with a sinful nature. He's not born with any nature, with any nature. Nature is the development of what you've done with your endowments. How can a baby be born with a sinful nature? Now, if I can find this little thing that I use to change this, I'm the proverbial absent-minded professor. By the way, would you turn those lights out right there? I want somebody to read that for me. Just see if, you, if it shows up so everybody can read it. Nature. By nature, I mean by the way things or beings are or their characteristics. Yes, our values. You could say that. By nature, I mean the way things or beings are, that's right now, that's the reality of the situation, or their characteristics and values. Now, let me give an example of that. There's several kinds of nature, friends. The only two kinds that I am interested in today, you ought to write these down. It's physical nature and moral nature. We're not going to talk about chemical nature. The only two kinds of nature which we are concerned with in theology and in soul winning 
are moral and physical, but people are forever mixing them all up. Mix them up something terrible, and then you get confusion. Now, if I had a piece of glass in my hand, I would say, now let me tell you the physical nature of glass. So in doing that, and I start telling you its characteristics, its qualities. So I say to you, glass is hard. When glass breaks, it has sharp edges. Is that right? Glass is brittle. It's not malleable, is it? at room temperature. And if you want a scientific definition of it, it is a super cool liquid. Did you know glass is a liquid? Most people don't know that. A super cool liquid, that's right. What do you think ice is? I've often said even you could walk on water if you could take the heat out of it. So when you look at the, this word nature, it, it's not so ethereal, is it? It does lie within the realm of our comprehension we, when we say the nature of something. So I just gave you the physical nature of glass. It's hard. It's brittle. It breaks with sharp edges and so forth. That's not a moral nature, is it? It doesn't have a moral nature. Why? Also, can't. That's right, non living, can't feel, can't choose. So, even this can't have a moral nature. All right, let's go a little further. Now then, I want you to look at this little piece of art I have here. If you don't like that, blame me. Now then, I'm going to give you the justification here for ethics. For ethics. Then I'll give you a definition of ethics down the road and all this. Now, let's say we take two pieces of steel. One of them is this long. The other one's only going to be about that long. And this is going to be attached to a piece up here, which is very heavy, which is going to run back and forth on this long one. So we'll call that one up above, this one. And the long one down here, which is stationary, is this one. Now, in engineering, we have what we call finishes. When we say we want a certain finish, we just don't leave it up to guesswork. And so we'll have a, a symbol which we will put on a drawing which looks like this. And it may say this in there, or it may say this. And we call those a micro finish symbol. A micro finish symbol. Now 50 then is a lot small uh, is a lot smoother than a 250. How many of you men know what a wrist pin is in an automobile? One, two. That's that part that goes through the piston and is in the connecting rod, and it's a piston that drives the connecting rod up and down, which turns the crankshaft, which turns the drive shaft, which turns the wheels, right? Now, that wrist pin, it's about that long, it's about that big around, it has a micro finish on it of 10. And by the way, when you get from here down to here, that costs money and from here down, oh boy, does the cost really go up now. So I said, the top piece here, we will say is two inches long, that's this way, and it's one inch this way. So it has a two square inch area. All right, now we'll say that we have a load on this one, 
which is going to move back and forth, and this one of 10 tons. So 10 tons would be 20,000 pounds. And if you got two square inches, that would be 10,000 pounds, as we say, PSI, pounds per square inch. That's what it's loaded to, 10,000 PSI. Now, that's not a high load for steel. We'd say it's got a, according to the kind of steel and how hard it is, it has a factor of safety of about three there without even being hardened. And the average person would say, oh, yes, that's not, that's not overloaded. But, and by the way, he might be right according to the load. But it's not the way it appears. So, by the way, in that connecting rod, or uh, wrist pin I was talking about, we make those to five micro finish. Then we put them on another machine for about 20 seconds. It roughs them up to 10, which is a bunch of little grooves around there. See, five millionths of an inch deep. So the oil can circulate through there. But well, most of it is five millions. That's the, and by the way, we can check. I've checked many a job just with that fingernail of mine that acts as a stylus. We have a machine called a profilometer, which will ride along and go up and down those valleys there, you see. Now then, these peaks are what we call in science asperities. Asperities. So now then, this is loaded to 10,000 PSI. So we bring this down now. But by the way, in one like this, it'd be about three to four peaks that would line up. What I've done is, I've taken this thing, which you would look at, and you'd run your finger across it like this, this uh, lens. You say, my, that's nice and smooth. And uh, let's say that is a five micro finish. But wait a minute, now I take a photograph of this, what we call a photomicrograph, and we will blow it up to a magnification, Steve, of 250 times, and that's the way it looks. See, that's the way it really is, when you can blow it up to 250 times. So now, when you take these two so-called smooth pieces of steel, is it two square inches, Ed? I should say it's not. It's just a few of these mountain peaks that are touching each other. And then when you get a good load on this load of 10,000 PSI, these mountain peaks that are like this, that are touching one another, and they sit there very long with this load, they cold weld to one another. They cold weld. Because now the unit loading is up there, it may be in the millions. PSI because just a few of these. Okay, now if you let it sit there very long, and the longer you let it sit there, the more firm the, and stronger the coal weld is. And when you move this piece, now it shears off that mountain peak. And by the way, that may be only a little round ball, a diameter of one millionth of an inch or less. Now that begins going back and forth with it, and it gets bigger each time and becomes like a snowball. And that's how things made out of metal wear out. Now then, the very nature of steel, moving upon steel, says this. When a, one piece of steel is touching another piece of steel, and one of them moves, or both of them move, you get what? Friction. friction. That's right. With friction, you get heat. And with heat and movement, you get wear. So, the very nature of steel moving upon steel demands lubrication. Now, lubrication or oil or whatever kind of you're using, maybe water, but oil is put in between here, and you ought to write this down. It's to keep parts apart. That's the purpose of lubrication, to keep parts apart. If they don't touch, are you going to get friction? And if you don't get friction, are you going to get wear? Now, you see, I have shown you this in the mechanical nature. You see what I'm saying? Now, you that know anything about an automobile, is it optional if you want your car to run for 50 or 100,000 miles, whether you put oil in a crankcase? Is that optional? <laughs> when my daughter was at Southmore in college, I bought her a new Toyota. 
She come home with it four or five months later. I said, honey, when did you change the oil? She said, what's that? <laughs> what do you mean change the oil? All I do is drive it, Dad. I said, oh, boy, let me look at this oil. So one of there's any in it. <laughs> is it optional as to whether you have oil in a crankcase? No. I'm going to show you. Ethics in life is not optional either. The very nature of steel, moving upon steel, demands lubrication. Now, friends, ethics is the lubrication of life. I might also add the biblical type of love called agape love. That's the lubrication of life. You get that? Is that optional? I should say it is not. Then why do preachers make it optional? I'll never be able to figure that out. I'll never be able to figure that out. I'll tell you, it's not optional if you want to walk with Jesus Christ. It's not optional. It'll be the very, very characteristic of your life. So you can see, I've used this as a metaphor now. From a machine to show you the characteristics of this demands lubrication. And by the way, this just shows the moving parts of a punch press and uh, places where we know we got to have lubrication. And uh, this is what we call a roundicity gram of a part to tell how round it is. You know, it's impossible to make anything perfectly round. <laughs> so that's what this is showing. And now I show this little drawing here. This thing runs 7,000 RPM. You put one grain of sand in there and you'll ruin it. One grain, one grain. And we have this saying in engineering. No air, no air. There's a part in the upper left-hand corner, the long one. That's a jet engine part. Several of those are jet engine parts. Some of those are just machine tool cutters, but every one of them has a, a definite micro finish, which we put on here. And now then, uh, this, what this is, is some engineering economics, which what this is showing is the tolerance, like the plus or minus two thousandths, five thousandths, or one tenth. As when you r close your tolerances, the cost goes way up. And the reason for it is you got various types of equipment that you've got to do, do to go to these various types of tolerances. Now this one is the finish. When you go from 250 down to 5 and 10, look how this cost goes up. And by the way, we have this charted. This has taken thousands of hours in engineering time to come up with these kind of things because we know it's very, very serious, and especially in the aircraft industry, we'll kill, we'll kill them by the hundreds if, if a man doesn't understand this. And by the way, when we bring a young man in from engineering school, he usually doesn't know anything about this. And don't think we don't do sit down and give him a brainwashing on this. Because these guys will make drawings that'll say 0. .00001. That's like the Cubs scoreboard, you know. <laughs> Boy, does, does that cost money. Oh, sometimes the closer you make it, the worse it is. You've got to have room in there for lubrication if it's round. Now, uh, this is another one doing the same thing. Now, what I'm trying to say is, look in engineering and in science how serious we take this. But now we're going to get into ethics, and most Christians never even had a lecture on ethics. That is a crime against nature. That's a crime against nature. Sure, we're, we're all concerned that our cars run well and they do what they're designed to do, and when it's cold, they start, and when it rains, they don't leak and things like that, but as to be able to get the most out of your life and to treat the other fellow right, hardly any teaching has ever been done on ethics, especially in corporation ethics. Now, it all starts with this one. This is called the Hippocratic Oath. Now, doctors take this. I've never been able to understand how a doctor can perform abortions when he's taken this, if he still subscribes to it. Above all, not knowingly to do harm or not intentionally to do harm. How can a doctor who subscribes to the Hippocratic Oath, how can he perform an abortion? <gasps> he can't. 
But by the way, I also say to you, you can't be a good American and believe in abortion. What do you think of that? What does our Constitution say? We believe in the inalienable rights. Inalienable means non-transferable. Of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I wish you'd have put property in there because you don't get happiness by pursuing it. Nobody ever found happiness by seeking it. You can find happiness by losing your life for the gospel's sake and service to Christ and your fellow man. But Jesus said if you save your life, you'll what? That means if you're going to live to gratify yourself, you'll lose it. But if you'll lose it for my sake and the gospel's, you'll find it. Great Christian paradox. You find by losing, you live by dying. But that's the way it is, nevertheless. So, if we believe in the inalienable rights of life, how can any doctor take the life away from that little baby and still be an American? I think we ought to tell them that. Oh, we live in a day when they talk about rights, 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 rights. When are we going to start talking about responsibilities, responsibilities? With every right we have, we have responsibilities, sometimes ten responsibilities for every right. It's not right to teach people rights without teaching responsibilities that go along with it. So you cannot even be a decent American and believe in abortion. A woman says, uh, I believe I ought to have control over my body. I say, so do I. I believe that. If you really did it, you wouldn't need an abortion in the first place. Isn't that right? And they say, when does it become a baby? Well, I, about 100 years ago in science, I was taught, one of the first three laws of science is it takes life to beget life. That's the most basic thing you can be taught in science. It takes life to beget life. And there's life in there when that sperm is deposited. There's life. So a lot of their objections to this just don't make any sense, especially don't make any scientific sense. But you know, the human mind, the human heart, it's funny, you can get it to believe anything you want if you want it bad enough. That doesn't make it true. So it starts all this, I, not knowingly, to do harm. I don't think that's very profound, but uh, if everybody lived by that one, this world would be about 10 times better off place to live. Now, now please turn the lights off again. Could I have somebody to read that for me? Ethics is a, is a science of the morality of human acts. It is a science because it is a body of ordered truth. The order and truth being supplied by rational analysis <coughs> of, of evidence and facts. If I were you folks, I'd write that one down. There is a definition of ethics that you I don't think you'll be able to improve upon. Ethics is a science of the morality of human acts. What makes it a science? Well, the work and the study that people have put into this to come up with a subject but those facts were already here, weren't they? They just had to be put in proper what? Order. That's right. So it is a science because it, it is a body of ordered truths. The order and truth being supplied by rational analysis of evident facts. Do you all have that copy down yet? Yeah. <coughs> Boy, that water you got here, some water wreck. <laughs> or is that battery acid you gave me up there? <laughs> Montana, they call that sheep dip. <laughs> Whoo, that about curls your hair, doesn't it? <laughs> My eyeballs are spinning there for a little bit. What'd you put in that? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Which place is it from here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Did everybody got that down? Anybody want to argue about it? Well, you want to realize I'm about as infallible as a pope. Which means neither one of us are. Who will take this one for us? <laughs> Can't hear you. Louder, please. Do it the way you would if you was reaching for your paycheck. <laughs> yes. It provides a standard by which man... Get that a standard. I thought there was no standard. You bet your boots are standards. <coughs> Am I and you folks away sitting right here? Can you still? Too fast for you? Yeah. Okay. Every time I do that, the backup will be five dollars. So. Are you ready? Yes. Who will read that one for us? Out loud, that is. Like all the sciences which have for their purpose the assembling of facts, principles, and rules, directive of thinking or of acting, ethics is essentially practical. Yes, ethics is essentially practical. Let me tell you, it'll be the most practical subject that you ever study in this life, if you come to understand it, and then from a right intention of heart, obey what you know you ought to do. Not because it pays, but because it's right, and because it pleases God, and treats your fellow man right. Sometimes your ethics is going to cause you to lose money in a very short run. I've seen time with my ethics really cost me very, very dearly in money. But you know, I could sleep at night then. What's good is money if you can't sleep. I lost jobs on account of ethics. And you see, if you don't stand for right when right costs you, then you don't love right. You don't love truth. No. There's physical characteristics. There's physical nature and there's moral nature. See? I was using that in relationship to the word nature. See? There isn't physical ethics because and physical ethics is affected. Your f physiological makeup is, is affected by your moral nature. That's for, tr that's for certain. And that will determine a lot of your ethics. But I know nothing of physical ethics. In fact, I never even heard the term before. But there's such a thing as physical nature and moral nature. All right, everybody have that? In a little while, we're going to get into what makes wrong, wrong, and what makes bad, bad, and good, good. This we have to know, friends. 
This is the college kids, the Christian kids on college campus. They haven't the faintest idea how to answer these things because they're running around handing out little booklets, four things God wants you to know, four spiritual laws which ain't even laws. A law always has sanctions connected with it. Is that right? Well, if I tell you God loves you, is that a law? How do you obey God loves you? Can you disobey God loves you? No, that's a statement of fact, not a law. Don't go around telling people here's four spiritual laws when they're not even laws. They'll think you just fell out of the first grade. <laughs> My goodness, you know, a simplified gospel, oversimplified, is worse than no gospel. There's one thing worse than making the gospel too complicated. You know what that is? Oversimplified. Then you leave out the real essence and the real meaning. The guy says, the simple gospel. I said, is man a simple creature? I should say not. He's a very, very complex creature. And he doesn't get delivered by this simple gospel. But boy, when you oversimplify things, you leave out the real essence, the real substance. And don't have a canned approach. You know, two of them got the same problems out there. And you ought to encourage questions from them. Encourage questions. Because maybe sometimes both of you will learn something. I've been asked questions I couldn't answer, and I'd say, I don't know. But, brother, I'm telling you, it wasn't very many days before I knew. I got knocked down lots of times witnessing on campuses. But after you've knocked a guy down 50 times and he's got up and got the answer, he's kind of hard to knock down then, isn't he? So when you go out to witness, who do you think it helps the most? That's right. It helps a person who witnesses because he becomes stronger each time. You want to know why many Christians are so weak? Well, they never got out and witnessed. They never did anything. Well, how do you think this arm of mine would be if I left it there like that for 20 years? Or let somebody even tie it tomorrow. I'll tell you what, in six months I couldn't even do this. That's why many people just don't really have a witness. They really have no life for God whatsoever. They're dead and they don't know it because they've never gone out and exercised their faith. Morality is the goodness or the badness, the rightness or the wrongness of human acts. Now then, who will read this for me? An act that is morally right is always good for us in the truest Yeah, what do you think that means of a lower order? Passing good of a lower, lower order. Well, you want me to tell you? It may seem very crude. I had been flying all day on a very musty, hot airplane. And we that got off, we had GO, that's called goat odor. <laughs> <laughs> I got into Miami and I went in the hospital, in the hotel, take a shower and have dinner. And so I went out to get some fresh air. I walked down Biscayne Boulevard. A woman came up to me and she stopped me. She said, "Sir, you like women?" I said, "Of course I like women." Well, he said, "There's a car." She said, "There's a carload of New York models just came in this afternoon. Would you like to have a date with one of them?" I said, "No." She said, "I thought you liked women." I said, I do. I married one. <laughs> well, she said, where is she? I said, Rockford, Illinois. Well, he said, she said, she'll never know it. I said, what are you going to do about God? <laughs> He's here. I also could have said, how about my body? Think my body will know it? See, I may, I may have gone with her, and I could have gone with her and had fun for 10 minutes, right? And four weeks later, wind up with a disease I'd have the rest of my life. See, that's what we mean here. Productive of some passing good of a lower order. 10 minutes is real passing as far as I'm concerned. Like I said many times, look, I can't afford the high cost of low living. <laughs> You get that? I can't afford the high cost 
That's a lower order of, of a lower order. Productive of some passing good of a lower order. It may be much lower than what we ever bargained for, Ed. So when we go out and do something wrong to gratify us, that's what we're doing. It may be productive of some passing good or pleasure. Pleasure. Like yeah, like stealing. And you got a little money for a while, so you're going out and have fun for maybe one night. But then you may wind up in a penitentiary for five or ten years where you belong. Uh, by the way, was it worth it? But by the way, when you steal, though, you're saying, I'm more important than that person who owns it. Well, are we more important than the other person? Listen, I don't know your names. Uh, most of you, 98% of you in here, but I know this about you. I know this, you're very valuable because you're made in the image of God. You're made in the image of God. That makes you valuable. I know this, yes? Would you repeat that um, I can't afford the high cost of life? Low living. Oh. Now I forgot what I was going to say. It must have been real profound. Huh? <laughs> I know this, you're very valuable. So when you first, when you begin to think you're going to do something to a person that's going to affect that other person in the wrong way, you've got to realize that person is valuable. What makes him valuable? Made in the image of God. That's why God instituted capital punishment. Because how valuable man is. And that's one of the things about Christianity, it sure teaches you the value of the other person. I don't know of any other system of thought and ethics in the world that does. I also know this. You're unique. Not another one in the world like you. My mother had 11 children. Was she glad she didn't have twins when she had me? <laughs> you women won't buy a dress if you see it on some other woman. Well... It's all right. There's not another one like you in the whole world. You're unique. Never was, never will be another one like you. Maybe close. So you're unique. What you always want in clothes, you've got it in you. Isn't that right? Third, you're important. Every one of you in this room, you're as important as I am. And some of you may be more important than I am. But I'm an old codger with one foot in the grave and the other foot on a banana peeling. <laughs> You're important. Let me show you how important you are. You are so important that God gave his only son to die for you. How much more important you want to be, you egghead? <laughs> I was very kind when I said egghead, too. So when you f begin to feel depressed and down the dumps and start looking for old tires, <laughs> just think. I'm valuable, I'm unique, and I'm so important that Jesus died for me. And I'll tell you, you can smile to yourself and go to sleep and not feel sorry for yourself no matter what happened to you that day. Boy, when you're so important that God himself and the person of Jesus Christ died for you, how much more important you want to be. And I don't care who you are upon the face of this earth. Or when I see little kids over in Africa that are starving in India and places like that, it's important that I help them financially because they're important. They're valuable. They're unique. And God loves them, doesn't he? How's he going to love them then? With angels, cherubims, and seraphims? I'll tell you how he's going to do it. He's going to do it with your hands, your eyes, your pocketbook and my pocketbook. That's how he's going to do it. In real, tangible ways. Tangible. Do you get that? Some way you could reach out and touch. Because why? If Christ dwells within you, and if Christ thinks they're important and they're valuable and unique, how do you think you ought to? You can't really think that way unless you act that way. Because if you don't act that way, as this thing is saying here, it's really not a belief, it's just a preference. Just a preference. 
So, morality is that which is always good for us, in the truest sense, always good. Just think of all these couples today that are shacked up that are not married. You think that's good for the woman? She's got to be a 24-carat dummy. He got to walk away from her any time, leave her four or five kids, right? Saddled with them. He walk out any time. Listen, if, if, if a woman's good enough to live with, she ought to be good enough to marry, shouldn't she? And if a woman hadn't got enough sense to put her foot down and say, buddy, boy, if you don't marry me, you can get lost, she's going to suffer the consequences. She'll never have the joys of marital bliss. Never. And by the way, the joys of marital bliss, they transcend the size of the house and the furniture, whether it's early ugly or drunken fight. <laughs> yes, that's right. And women need to put their foot down like that and say, hey, buddy boy, you're going to grow up? So you see here, it's always good for us in the truest sense. Is it good for a woman to let a man make a chump out of her like that? He isn't only making a chump out of her, he's even getting cooperation from her. An act that is morally wrong is always bad for us in the most important of ways, even though it may be, I said maybe, productive of a passing good. A New York a writer came to the city of Chicago and was doing, was doing a research project on Skid Row. And he stayed in these flop houses. And he did it for a week. In those days, it used to cost about 30, 40 cents a night, as the fellows would say, for a flop. All he got was a little cot with a very poor mattress on it, maybe some excuse for a blanket. And the only difference between the rooms would be a wire stretch from this way down that way and back. And there was be kind of a sheet in between them. That was a room. He said, the thing that surprised me about this, most of those men in those rooms cried themselves to sleep every night and would lay there and cry in their sleep all night. You know why? Many of them have abandoned a good woman they were married to with children. You think that doesn't affect a man? They weren't willing to get up and go to work every day. They weren't willing to watch over them. They weren't willing to protect, weren't willing to supply their needs. But here they are, spend the rest of their life crying themselves to sleep. So, by a man abandoning his wife and children, you see what I mean? It's always morally wrong for us. Why? Because the way it's going to tear us up emotionally. Because we know better. We know we shouldn't do that. I had a man. Now, when I was a president and chief executive officer of a company, I helped a lot of men get out of penitentiary. And I don't mean over the wall. <laughs> I signed their parole papers and release papers. Because in our state, a man cannot get paroled and put out on the street unless he, somebody promises him a job. <coughs> so in Illinois, why preachers and people who care about men who have made mistakes and have paid their debt to society will come around and see us fellows who ran a corporation. And I had a black preacher one day come in to see me, and he said, Brother Khan, do you believe in being merciful? I said, Reverend Saul Nair, I'd better be merciful because my Bible says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It's only merciful people that's going to get mercy from God. Not these people that carry a grudge all their life with bitterness. No, no, they won't make it. Jesus said, If you don't forgive your fellow man, my Heavenly Father will not forgive you. So I said to this black preacher, Brother, I'd better be merciful. So he thought he'd try me for size. He said, well, there's a fine young man in my church that got in a very, very unfortunate fight when he was 16 years of age, and he got life. He got life. And he made parole three years ago. But he can't get out because nobody will give him a job. He said, Mr. Khan, would you give him a job? 
I said, would you sit down and tell me all about him, what you know? 16 years old when he sent up for life. I said, yes, I will. Go get the papers and I'll sign them. And I'll give him a job here. And I got to know this young, but this way, at the time, he's no lad anymore. He came in, this black lad, or man. And I, I tried to give him whatever one of us need. You know what that is? A friend. Tried to be a friend to him. And I'm a friend to him to this day. I spent so much time with him, but six months later, I led him to Christ. Now, I didn't read no four spiritual laws. <laughs> God help us. God deliver us from that terrible stuff. If I ever catch you giving out one of them, don't you ever come and even talk to me. <laughs> You've been to school and you don't know any better than that. Oh, you must have been behind the door when Rick passed out the brain. <laughs> I spent real time teaching this fellow. One day he wants to get saved. I didn't twist his arm. I'm not an arm twister. I just lay the truth on him and then pray. I've robbed a lot of people of a lot of sleep. <laughs> well, I, I got a lot of others out of the penitentiary because this was such a good, uh, by the way, within a year he's running our most sophisticated piece of equipment. We have one of the most sophisticated manufacturing facilities in the whole country. And he was running our most sophisticated piece of equipment. And he's never been back to a penal institution. But by the way, I began to get others out. But oh, I wish I could say my luck was as good with the rest of them as it was with this guy Jim Box I was just telling you about. I'd get some of them out in two weeks, they'd be right back in. Some of them be a month. So finally I said to my man who I put in charge of my college boys, that's what I used to call those guys, that was our code word for them, because when they came in, I said, don't you talk around here that I got you out of a penitentiary or that you were even in a penitentiary. You walk straight and behave yourself. That's all I ask. And don't go talking about your crimes, because when you do that, you start reliving them, see? You start reliving them. I said, you forget about that which is past. Press on to do what's right and good. And I don't want to hear any talk about it. Otherwise, no bragging of what you've done. Well, many of them, they get back in in two weeks, a month. So finally, some of you in here, you know about that chart which I use in the Moral Government of God, which shows the, the consequences and how man's put together. I have this man in my office, a very, very tough looking man, but you could tell he'd been a very handsome man at one time. But by this time, he looked harder than a rock. And he told me, he said, Mr. Khan, I spent 18 of the last 20 years in state penitentiaries. I said, what for? He said, well, 20 years ago in the state of California, he said, I walked away from a wonderful woman, the wife of my children. I had four children. I abandoned her. I gave her $200 magnanimously to raise my children on. <laughs> and he said, I disappeared. Didn't like the responsibility. And he said, I'd get some money and I'd go in a tavern and I'd drink. He said, you know why I drink? I said, sure, you're trying to drown that guilt, weren't you? He said, that's right, trying to drown my guilt. Well, I said, the next morning the guilt wasn't gone, was it? He said, no, it was bigger. But he said, then I'd be broke. Then I'd go out and mug somebody or snatch a purse or break an enter. I'd get caught. I get sentenced, I'm right back in the state penitentiary. 18 out of 20 years. 18 out of 20 years. And I had that thing written on a big accounting ledger type of paper. I said, well, why? Why? And the tears began to come down this fellow's face like a torrent, like a river. And he began to sob, and he became all unglued. I wasn't going to ask him any questions. I just sat there and let him unwind. And he said, Harry, it's that one right there. What you got down there, Mr. Kahn, that one? I said, well, what's that? He said, guilt. Only one thing I agree with Sigmund Freud on, only one thing. The rest of his psychology is the biggest pile of baloney. It never came out of a meatpacking house. <laughs> and that is... He said, man's biggest problem is guilt. 
And it really is. You know why? Because we're all guilty. Well, why did they run to a shrink with their guilt? Why don't they run to a preacher? I mean a real preacher that can help them, that knows something. He said, that one right there, and what I did to that good woman, what I did to that good woman. Now, mind you, friends, he was never put in jail for that. The state of California, a dear liberal state, never arrested him for desertion or abandonment like they would in Indiana. They would put him in penitentiary for doing that in Indiana. Never was put in any penalist, never arrested. But by the way, did he get away with it? You know, if the state of California had given him five years in jail, he might have got it out of his system, or five years in a penitentiary. As it was, it ruined 20 years of his life. By the way, don't you think this needs to be taught to every man in the United States? And when he marries a woman and he, and he has children, he has responsibilities to them, that if he will assume and fulfill those responsibilities, there will be good consequences. But if he doesn't, there's going to be penalties connected to it, because that's the way we're made. That's the way we're made. That's in accordance with our nature, Ed. Now, just to give you another example, some of you have heard me before, I want you to listen to this one. My wife and two children, two daughters, and a neighbor girl started to drive to Sarasota, Florida, the day after Martin Luther King was, was killed. I don't like to say assassinate. That's for presidents and kings. And uh, they had a race riot in Chicago. And we lived 90 miles from Chicago, but you got to drive around Chicago to get started south. There's smoke and everything that's coming across. They're only moving five and 10 miles an hour. The race riots, and they're burning down blocks after blocks of buildings in Chicago, even burning their own houses down. Doesn't that make sense? Well, on the west side of Chicago at that time, here is a city bus that's going down this particular street, picking up people, and here they come to the street corner, and here's about 30 of them standing there, blacks and whites, wanting to get out of there. The only thing to do, friends, when you're in an area where they have race rides, the only one thing to do is get out. Just get out. Because people's brains goes out the window when they get in, something like that. Be they white or black. Just, just get out of the area. Well, here come, came a four-door car with the windows rolled down, two blacks in the front, one teenage black in the back, and he had a rifle in his hand. As he went by this street corner where here's these 30 people all huddled close together, both blacks and whites, not fighting one another, just wanting to get out of there. As he went by, he took this rifle and promiscuously just pointed it toward the crowd and he pulled the trigger, aimed into the middle of this crowd. He hit a little 10-year-old girl right in the head, went through it, she dropped dead immediately. And by the way, that was his own sister. He was never arrested for that. By the way, do you think he got away with it? Huh? I should say he didn't get away with it. In 10 days, he was a stark, raving, screaming, psychotic man. Maniac in Dunning State Hospital. When are we going to learn that with every choice we make, there is a consequence inseparably connected with it? Two kinds of consequences. A primary consequence and a secondary consequence which may go through all this life and all through eternity. All through, if we don't get forgiveness from God and make it right with our fellow man. Now, now you begin to see what I mean here, an act that is morally wrong is always bad for us and bad for those to whom we, create, we do this against them. It's always bad for us in the most important of ways. Always bad. How about those men laying there and crying themselves to sleep every night? Eating them up, right? I dare say 99% of them wish they could go back and make it right. Now they wouldn't even know where to find them. And by the way, I've had a few young couples come to me 
before they got married and talked to me about it. And I said, you want to be happy? Oh, yes, I all want to be happy. I've said to him, you want me to tell you how to make sure you're happy in this married life and how, how for you to be happy in this married life? And when I get done, they're not so sure they want to get married. <laughs> you know what I tell him? If you're going to marry this girl just because she's nice looking, got a nice figure just to gratify you, in about one month you're going to be all gratified up and looking. You'll break her heart and you ruin your health. And I said to her, now if you just, because he's, he's tall, dark, and curly-haired and got broad shoulders, I mean, he may have an empty head, I don't know, he can't even make a living for you. <laughs> but young lady, if you'll marry that young man for one reason, that's to make him happy. You'll get happy. And young man, if you'll marry her, not to gratify yourself, but to make him happy, or her happy, because you never find happiness by seeking it. <clears throat> so, and I told one this within the last six weeks. I said, if you marry that girl just to make her happy, then when you don't get out of this world and out of this life and out of her, what you think you ought to get, you won't go off and pout in the corner like some poor old drunk in a tavern. Because, <laughs> look, you didn't marry her to make you happy anyway, did you? So if you ain't getting happy, what do you got to complain about? <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm teaching you how to go into it in the first place. You marry her to make her happy. And if you make her happy, I can guarantee you somebody else is going to get happy. But, but if you marry her to make you happy, uh, it isn't going to work. It isn't going to work. Don't you wish every preacher and every JP would tell that to the couples before they get married? Or any instructions about it? I'll tell you, I think there's fully 40% of them would never get married in the first place. And by the way, don't you think that's pretty good Bible and biblical advice? Would somebody read this one for us? Out loud, that is. <laughs> good in general, as defined by Aristotle and St. Thomas, is that which is suitable to the nature of a being. That is, that which benefits or helps it, suits it, perfects it, assists it, or is necessary for the existence or operation. Ah, somebody discuss it. Tell me what you think of that statement. Well, if it's suitable to us, I guess that just it's saying that uh, it's something that we can perceive or something that we can enjoy, it can be a part of us and we can yeah, and it won't violate our human nature, will it? Or violate our conscience. Or even our good sense. Yes, it'll go along with your design. A fulfillment. Because your design is to produce certain functions, isn't it? Many a man today doesn't like his work. You know why? Because he's not giving his company and his boss a day's work for a day's pay. How can he like it? If he's a thief, if he's a thief, how can he like it? Because it's against his nature. The way to be happy on your job is try to do the best job you know how to do and do it as under the Lord, not for money. Do it to glorify God. That means to render him excellent. Just yesterday morning after breakfast, I'm sitting there talking with a man who was my boss at one time. Man, was he a hard one for me to get through to. Married a very, very wealthy woman. His mind was on money, wasn't on spiritual things. And we were doing a job for Howard Hughes, and I had two assistant chief engineers, and my, they were falling on, flat on their face all over the place. And Hughes was no easy man to do business with if you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And they made so many red hot phone calls, this guy came up to me. He said, Harry, I'm getting all these phone calls from Hughes and I don't like it. Where do we stand? I said, well, I've had Al Drance on this and I've had Eldo Tonietti on this. And uh, they're doing everything they can. He said, how long? Oh, I said, about a week. He said, well, don't you think it's about time you got in on it? 
I said, if that's what you think, I'd be glad to. So I went down where they were, and I rolled up my pants legs, wearing the muck and the goo, and where you don't usually see engineers. And we're dirty. I said to them, just show me all your data. Just show me all your data. Tell me what you've done. They showed me their data and took quite a while, and I looked at it. And I prayed, and I worked, and I prayed, and I worked, and worked, and I prayed, prayed and worked. About an hour, here comes this man with the big financial genius. They're looking at me down in there. He said, Harry, how's it going? I looked up at him. I said, you don't need to worry about this problem. I'm not working for you. I'm working as under the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to glorify him in this. He looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> Do you know what David said when he ran toward Goliath? Do you know what he said? If you don't know, you ought to know. He went in with this thing. And by the way, when he crossed that stream to go toward Goliath, he picked up five round big stones. You know why five? He didn't figure he'd miss them four times. Goliath had four big brothers. One for each. After he got done with that big lummox. And here's the way he ran toward him. And here's what he was shouting. How's this for a motive? that all the world might know there's a God in Israel. That all the world might know there's a God. In, not that all the world would know how tough David was. That all the world might know there's a God in Israel. He's doing it to glorify God. And I said, I'm doing this to glorify the Lord. Just don't worry about it. Go on, get lost. <laughs> Fifteen minutes, the blessed Holy Spirit of God gave me the answer. But he wouldn't if I hadn't got down the muck in the mud, and down where the friction's really going on, and seeing what's happening with my own eyes, and looking at the data, and praying. Do you know in the Old Testament it says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Hiram. You know who Hiram was? Hiram Abiff, he's the one that made King Solomon's temple. Read that, boy, what an engineering feat that job was. He even designed it, but it says the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him. The Spirit of the Lord would come upon him. What, to give him real brain power. Real thoughts, real answers. And in my work, and head of research and, and engineering for many, many years, about 18, the first three years I wasn't a Christian. Oh, it was tough. But after I became a Christian and found out what the blessed Spirit of God was pleased to do with his children, and I'd go to him, and I'd ask him to come upon me like he did hire my Biff in the Old Testament so we could both glorify the Heavenly Father. I don't think there's enough people doing that that, that claim to be Christians today. Because God sometimes give us, gives us superhuman problems that take supernatural help. But there he is. And you know, friends, if we will do the possible, he will come alongside and do the impossible. So the problem is not to do the miraculous in our day. And he does give us some jobs that it'll take a miracle. But if we'll go ahead and do the possible, the blessed Holy Spirit of God will come alongside and he'll do the impossible. <laughs> if we just do the possible, that's the problem. Miracles are simple with God if we will do the possible. Like I taught my executives many times, you can pray for a good potato crop, but you better say amen with the hoe. <laughs> you get that? God doesn't bless lazy people. Is that right, Steve? You, you find God blessing any lazy people out the farm? No. I don't either. I never found it. You want the blessings of God upon your life, get to work. Get to work. So that which is suitable to the very nature of being. Now I'm going to get into nature here in a little while. That is, that which benefits or befits or helps, suits it, perfects it, assists it, or is necessary. Get that, necessary. You know, God sometimes gives you difficult things in this world that are necessary for you to do if you're going to grow and if you're going to mount anything in the kingdom of God. And just bow your head and say, Lord, I know this is a supernatural job. Just show me what the natural is, and I'll do that. You take care of the super, and he will. He will. 
All he's looking for is cooperation. I want you to read this one again. We're just reviewing a little here. Who will read, it? read this? Ethics defines a code of values to guide human action. It tells men the proper use of a man's life and the means of achieving it. It provides a standard by which men are to judge good and evil. Now, here is a great word we're going to talk about. It's a word ought. Word ought. O U G H T. Now, there's five words in the Greek for ought in the New Testament that are translated ought, and two of them ought not to be translated ought. <laughs> but there are three, and one of those, it's only used once, I'm not even going to talk about it. But here is one, Othello, which means to owe. Also translated ought or to owe. Or it means to be obligated to or indebted to. And you read that in uh, Romans 1.16. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise, to the unwise. I'm under obligation to. See, we are under obligation to the people who haven't heard the gospel. We heard it. So we owe it to the fellow who hasn't heard it. What do you think of people who don't pay their debts? They're deadbeats, aren't they? The kingdom of God doesn't have deadbeats in it, friend. It's the most exclusive group in the world. This is a Greek word. By the way, it's used 36 times in the New Testament. You know how I know? I counted them. Didn't read that anywhere. No, but that's not the real word we want to... I want to really talk on for ought. What's this one? This one is used 105 times, Ed, in the New Testament. Day, D-E-I, or day, means ought. Now, would somebody read those off for me? That which is necessary, that which must be done, ought to be done, should be done, that which is proper, and in the imperfect, that which had to or should have been done. Well, do you remember when uh, Peter and John, those fellows, have just done some miracles? Do you remember that? <clears throat> Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. You remember that? What did they do to them then? <coughs> what? Healed the lame man. Yes, they healed the lame man, but what did they do to them? to the apostles. Don't you remember? Put them in jail. And they said, now, don't you preach anymore in this name of Jesus. Is that right? Or am I quoting you Shakespeare? Huh? Well, I just want to show you a verse. which I'm having a little trouble finding right now. I can quote it to you. He says, man ought to obey God rather than man. And I went right ahead preaching Jesus. Now, man ought to obey God. Ought. What does that say? What does this say? You know when it says ye must be born again, you know what the word must is there? Ought. So if a man wants to be a Christian, is it optional as to whether he's born again or not? Is it? Of course not. All right, when he says man ought to obey God, is it optional as to whether we obey God and still be in a right relationship with him? Where in heaven's name do these people get a gospel that has an optional discipleship or an optional obedience? Where do they get that? It doesn't come from the Bible. Now, obedience won't make you a Christian, but it's the unmistakable evidence of a Christian. The unmistakable evidence of a Christian. When he said... 
Marvel not, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The word there is they. Just translated must. But, but between must and ought really isn't any difference when you, when you know the definition of ought. Look at some of these others. Should be done. That which is proper. Get that. That which is proper. Let me tell you something about Billy Graham. Now, I'm not a great admirer of Billy Graham's preaching. But boy, I sure am of his life. Billy Graham, since the day he was married, has never ridden in an automobile with any woman other than his wife, unless there was some other person present. <coughs> Do you know why? Not proper. That's right. Not proper. Not proper. Sometimes you don't even have to ask what is right and wrong. Just ask yourself what is proper. What is proper? By the way, who should be more proper than people in whom Christ dwells? Yeah. Do you think Jesus ever did an improper act? No. We ought to be the most proper people in the whole world. Because that's a part of ought. Another meaning of ought. Oh, now it's turn. Somebody get this. Who will read this one? There is nothing flexible. What do I mean by flexible? What? Able to be moved Yeah, it can be. better think about that. Most of you haven't got it. I keep on reading it again. Start. I interrupted you, brother. I know. There is nothing flexible in the moral terms for right or perfect conformity with that which ought to be. It is act of harmony with the will of God, which is the law of his government, and is thus perfect cooperation with him in maintaining the eternal welfare of his moral universe. That's what makes something right. That's what makes something right. Because it's in harmony with who? God and what he wants. There is nothing flexible. By the way, give me another word there for flexible. What? That's right. Give me another word. Yes. Give me another word. How about negotiable? It's like with my daughters when they lived at home. Not that this was a problem, but when it came Sunday night, Ed, we went to church in our house. And by the way, it wasn't even negotiable. <laughs> you get that? <laughs> If you lived in our house, you went to church on Sunday night. That's all I was told you. You didn't live there. If you didn't want to live by Uncle Harry or old Daddy's rules, you can go get your own house. <laughs> you know, friends, we cannot let the inmates run the asylum. <laughs> I roomed across the hall from one of the five greatest preachers alive. He's not alive now. He's dead. Bless his heart. One time he's one of the five greatest. Who's telling me about when his daddy was dying, an old Baptist deacon? And he said, Daddy, I want to thank you for the times when I saw Jesus in your life. He said, Son, my goodness, in a weak voice, when did you see Jesus? When did you ever see Jesus in my life? See, the truly humble people don't know they're humble. See, if you really know you're humble, you aren't. <laughs> the truly humble people are not aware of it. He said, well, and he said to me, Harry, I'll tell you when I saw Jesus in him. He said, we were sharecroppers down in North Carolina. My daddy was the superintendent of this huge farm. We lived in this mansion owned by the man who 
had tremendous amounts of money, lived 40 miles away in Charlotte. My daddy's superintendent of the grounds, and we had 13 kids. My daddy, the Baptist deacon. And he said there was a railroad spur that came right up alongside of our house, and my daddy came in from the fields one day. He saw this private railroad car there. He came on in the house, and he heard a dance band playing. In the, there's a ballroom in the house. And he said, we little kitties were all around that circular staircase peeking to see what's going on in there. They're playing cards, and the men are sporting with the women. They're dancing and uh, carrying on. He said, my daddy came in the house. And so he took off his hat, his old weather beaten face. So what was going on? He said, the fire began to shoot out of my daddy's eyes. Just the fire, he said. C.W. C.W. Three times, and old C.W. came running. He was just the owner. <laughs> Pulled out his big old watch at Turnip. Says C.W., see those little kitties of mine up there that I'm raising for Jesus Christ. I'm a steward of them. They're not mine, they're his. And you bought brought this bunch of unspeakable whirlings into my home. You're dancing, you're gambling, you're doing all of this. He said, I give you two minutes to get them out of here on that train. He's telling that to the owner, to his boss. And my friend says, in two minutes, they were all on that train, a colored band, their big bass fiddle and all of these instruments, and they're on their way back to Charlotte. He said, Daddy, that's the day I saw Jesus in you. See, the people today, they don't know there is that kind of a Jesus. How about Jesus when he went in the temple? Huh? That's the same Jesus that fed the 5,000, but a different phase of his spirit. Don't have a lopsided, sentimental Jesus. And he said, Daddy, that's the day I saw Jesus in you. Jesus hated sin, didn't he? How many of us are going to take sides with God against sin? And by the way, the great Charles Grandison Finney said, you're going to be a servant of God. Your problem is, one of them is, to go around and tear all the sinners' hiding places down. Second, take sides with God against sin. By the way, that's no easy thing, but he doesn't call you to a life of roses, does he? And a bed of roses? No. We're soldiers. Soldiers. I can remember sitting out in the woods with a 30-30 under my arm, soaked and wet for hours. I can also remember that gun being so hot, I couldn't hold it anymore. I had to lay it down. And I'm soaked to the skin. I, I, I'm cold. I'm tired. I'm getting sick. And the captain come by. You think he patted me on the shoulder and said, oh, Connie, you're a good little boy. You're a good little soldier. You know why he didn't do that? because I was a soldier, and that's what it was expected of me. My Bible says this. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. How many soldiers of Jesus we got? And I like that old song which says, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And should I blush to speak his name? or fear Tony's cause? Well, we better get some of this kind of Christianity back, or you can give it all back to the Indians. That's what makes right, right? Because it's in harmony with God and with the way he created us. And we're going to get in, on the afternoon, I'm going to get into the nature of man. But let's just read this one. Somebody read it, and we'll go to lunch. Wrong, therefore, which is perfect wrong, therefore, which is perfect conformity with that which ought not to be, is thus acted in harmony with the will of God. And so is perfect antagonism against God himself and against all who are in harmony with him. And it is therefore anarchy in its attitude towards his government. Now, I want you to look at this word, in harmony. If I said something is inactive, does that mean it's active? Huh? No. Oh. If I say somebody's intransigent, does that mean they're going to change very easy? It means they won't change, right? If I say somebody is inhuman, 
Does that mean they're very human? Okay, so what do you think this means there when it says in harmony? It's out of harmony with God, isn't it? Now, if, if, you, if these were two different words, that would be different, but they're not. That's one word. In harmony means out of harmony. And what is salvation but being reconciled to God? What is reconciliation but adjusting our differences, being restored to favor? Is that right? Well, if we're reconciled to God, we're in harmony with God. In, but that's two words, in harmony. But why, when you say something is in harmony, it is what? Give it to me another word. It's out of harmony. It's anti. Now, it's that in mind of that word right there. Ed, would you read that one, a whole thing again? Wrong, therefore, which is perfect conformity with that which ought not to be, is thus active in harmony with the will of God, and so is perfect antagonism against mm -hmm. God himself, and against all who are in harmony with him, and it is therefore anarchy in its attitude towards his government. Yeah. If I steal from my government, I'm out of harmony with God, and by the way, it hurts you. If I, if I cheat on my income taxes, it hurts you. It hurts you. By the way, it hurts somebody else. You know who? Yes, it hurts God, but it hurts me. Because God never created man to be a cheat, did he? <coughs> All right, Steve, would you dismiss us and we'll go to lunch.